Bobby Charlton played a record-breaking 106 times for England. He scored more goals, 49, than any other player to pull on the three Lions. He played 758 times for Manchester United, again a record, and scored an amazing 249 goals. A European Footballer of the Year, in every judge's top ever best 11, Bobby Charlton played in the two defining games of the 1960s, becoming one of the immortal 11 to lift the World Cup in 1966, and again at Wembley two years later for United, when they became the first English team to win the European Cup. And in 1970, he was the undisputed star player in arguably England's greatest ever team that was so tragically put out of the World Cup when on the brink of victory by Germany. He is one of the very few footballing knights and the first English player to be inducted into the Football Hall of Fame. But numbers and statistics cannot pay justice to this great player and great man. He is a player who truly personified his era. He was a Busby babe in the 50s, survived the Munich air disaster and went on to become the epitome of the modern football star. His partnership with Best and Law is immortalised in football history as the greatest forward line any club has ever enjoyed. His behaviour, both on and off the field, was always exemplary and modest, even though he was spectacularly talented and skillful. His tactical play, becoming the first deep-lying centre-forward striking from midfield again and again, was way ahead of his time. Never sent off, and only booked once, a booking that was later rescinded, Bobby Charlton became a true global superstar, a player known all over the world for his skill and England's greatest ever player. This is Ashington North School. It gave the country two World Cup winners. Jack and Bobby went back there in the 1990s to reminisce. Oh, is Whenever that? you had a team pitch, it was always taken. That's right. The school gave Bobby his first taste of football glory. Do you remember your teacher? Well, my teacher, Mr. McGuinness, I always remember having my picture taken at that place just where you're talking about. Yeah. And, and, and Miss Houston, who, uh, who was very kind, she made, our, she made the shorts that we used to wear out of the blackout curtains just after the war. In, fa in fact, the shelters were just here the blackout shelters, which we were supposed to use if there was any problem, but I think there was only one bomb fell on Ashington anyway. When Bobby was born in this corner of Northumberland in 1937, Ashington was a mining town. When the men weren't down the pit, they were playing or watching football. They lived the game. Even Bobby's womenfolk fully enjoyed his love of the beautiful game. I never, never ever dreamed that I would achieve half the things that I did achieve and starting off from a, as, a, as a little lad at Ashington. I mean, I'm like every lad that ever starts playing football. You all hope that one day you'll do it, and I was fortunate to be one of them that actually succeeded in doing it. And I did fulfill almost all the dreams that I ever had in football. Bobby's family was steeped in football. Bobby's mum was a Milburn, and he had four uncles, all professional footballers. Jack was the eldest, he went to Leeds. Then George, he went to Leeds following Jack. Then Jimmy went to Leeds. So they were all at Leeds together one, t one time or another. And I went to uh, Chesterfield later, and I went to Leicester after that. We all played in the first division. Yeah. I think it's in the Guinness Book of Records that the only family to have four brothers playing first division football at one time. And there was a cousin, Jackie Milburn, revered as a great centre forward for Newcastle and England and an idol for Bobby. Jackie was my great hero, Jackie Milburn. Me, me and my brother Jack used to go to Newcastle. It, I was, we used to work it out, it used to cost us two shillings and five and halfpenny, exactly, which was a, a shilling for the, for the bus fare, which was 15 miles, and then we had sixpence for, the, for our, our lunch, which was pie and chips at the Civic restaurant, and then the rest was for, to get us in to stand behind the goal. The highlight of it all was, was when more Jackie used to get the ball. Well, Jack used to get the ball, he used to be like grease lightning, off he went, finish up with a shot at goals and the whole of the, the Gallagher end would go, go crazy. 
Bobby Charlton inherited the family talent. He played for his school at Ashington, for county and regional teams. For England schoolboys, he was also good at class. Academically, he, he, he wasn't bad at all. Uh, after all, he, he came to a grammar school via the, the grading exam procedure, which put him automatically roughly in the uh, top 25% of, uh, of, of, of local pupils. And uh, when he was here, he was in the A stream. I think he's a little modest about his academic achievements, as he is in most things. I remember Mr. Heatherly, the French teacher, asking me one day something about French and querying something. And I, I remember answering him by saying, well, Mr. Heatherly, you know, I don't really see the point in this because I can't ever see myself traveling abroad. And I've, I've literally been all over the world with football since. Well, I remember having to, to sit in this desk here and I was always looking outside whenever there was any football going on and the, the teacher nearly always had to admonish me and say, you know, you, you better start concentrating more on your lessons rather than football because there's no future for you in that line. At 16, the young schoolboy international left the North East and travelled to Lancashire to learn his trade with Manchester United. But it always assumed, I think, that, uh, that I would go to Newcastle because I was always a Newcastle United fan and, I, and Jackie Milburn was me, me uncle and he was there. Um, but, but actually, when I, I played for East Northumberland schoolboys against um, Jarrow and Hebben on a very cold, frosty day in January, I always remember my mother coming and telling me that, uh, that there was a little man from Manchester United who, who had been watching the game and he'd come and said that if I, if I wanted to play for Manchester United when I left school in the summer, they would very much like me to go. I was aware that Manchester United had a really good coaching policy and they'd won the, youth, the FA Youth Cup the first few years in its existence. So, um, and I wanted to be a footballer as quick as I could and Joe Armstrong was the first. I actually, when I signed at 15, uh, I didn't immediately go and play with footballers, uh, train with footballers down at Old Trafford all the time because you couldn't sign professional till you were 17. And uh, unless you actually worked on the ground staff, you ha had to go and get a job. And my parents thought uh, it wouldn't be right for me cleaning because the, the image that people had of, uh, of schoolboys uh, who signed for professional clubs working on ground staff was they did the toilets and all that sort of thing. And, and of course, other, other people were saying, you better get yourself a trade just in case you break your leg. And, and I was always aware of that, although I never thought it would happen. Uh, so a lot of lads went into apprenticeships in industry and I went as an apprentice electrical engineer in Altrincham. And I worked there for a year, but I knew that as soon as I was 17, I was gonna sign professional. Um, but uh, it, it, was, uh, it was good, that it gives you a set of values working and working on piecework, two pound a week, and uh, which is a lot of money then. Old Trafford was where the best young players wanted to be. The club had plenty to choose from and it chose studiously. The manager was a father figure with visionary ambitions and faith in youth. The papers called his team the Busby Babes. It seemed like a magic formula for success. Well, I think it was... Uh... Growing up together, the teamwork, and not only on the field, but off the field, we were all the same age, and uh, we went out together, we socialised, we were all single at that time, and that was our part of growing up. Busby's belief in natural talent was total. They were encouraged to express themselves and not stifled under tactical master plans. Well, Manchester United has always had a reputation of, of having adventurous players and, and certainly being positive. They, they had never played an offside trap. They were always encouraged to, to express themselves freely. That was the Mad Busby way. There was no great tactics involved in it. It was just that everyone in their own position did what they were, was expected of them. You stayed together roughly as a unit. Uh, as a defender, you were expected to defend. A midfield player you were expected to create and help in defence. A forward player you were expected to score goals in. And you played to the best of your ability. And, and in so doing, it was so adventurous and so lovely for the people to watch because you really didn't know what was going to happen. Bobby was in three different United teams that won the FA Youth Cup. Well, even then, you, you could f see the, the grace and style that he had. He was, uh, uh, the talent was there and, and the smoothness. It was like, to me, always like a thoroughbred, like a racehorse. Uh, he, he moved so 
majestically at times. Just before his 19th birthday, Bobby made his debut against Charlton and scored twice. I'd done my right ankle, I'd, I'd done the ligaments in my right ankle and all swelled, swelled up just about the time when uh, I looked as though I might get in the first team. And, um, and uh, three weeks I had treatment on it and it was swollen, but it was, it, I was starting to do a bit of training anyway. And Sir Matt uh, came to me and he, on the Friday, one Friday morning and he just said, how's your ankle? And I, and I went, Oh, that's great. <laughs> I said, it's fine, man. Well, uh, I said, it's all right, boss. Bobby was the star of the all-conquering youth team, but increasingly a part of the first team. That year, United battled through to the semi-final of the FA Cup against Birmingham. The double was a possibility. It looked more likely when they took the lead. Bobby Charlton was making his debut in the competition. Now on this elevated stage, everyone could see that here was a star in the making. One up after 13 minutes, Manchester gave Birmingham no time to recover from the shock. United were pressing hard when Pegg hooked the ball back from the goal line and Charlton cracked it in. Well, the final was against Villa um, and uh, it'll always be remembered really as, as the controversial final with regard to uh, Peter McParland, the left winger. Who, who came and charged into Ray and the, you were allowed to touch goalkeepers in those days and Ray Wood had collected the ball and he was just on his way out to, to kick it and Peter McPollin came in on a very late run and collided with Ray Wood and, and actually broke his cheekbone. The following season was United second in the European Cup. They reached the quarterfinals and played Red Star Belgrade. Bobby scored at home and they took a 2-1 lead to Yugoslavia where he scored twice more. The game was played on frosty conditions, quite hard and slippery. Uh, but we were so we were so full of ourselves and confident at that time, yeah. and we went into a three 0 lead at half time. And suddenly, just a two one home aggregate lead uh, was five one in aggregate. And and I don't know why. Maybe it was just a, a little complacency. But we let things slip in the second half, and they came right back into the game and they scored three goals. And we were really under pressure at the end uh, to keep them out. But we drew 3-3, won on aggregate and, and went forward to the semi-final. So there again, Manchester United, another opportunity to prove that they were the best in Europe. As they boarded the plane to come home, the mood with the players, officials and journalists was buoyant. They made a refuelling stop at Munich, where the airport was snowbound. Three times the plane tried to take off. And we seemed to be going on and on and on along the runway. It kept waiting for it to take off and, and it never did. It ran straight off the end of the of the, the tarmac and um, through a fence and, and then I just didn't know what to expect and of course we, we hit a house and the next thing I remember was, um, was waking up sitting in a field about 100 yards from the airplane still in my seat with, with Dennis Violet next to me. E everything else was, was still. Here is the news. So far, we know there are 23 survivors after Manchester United's air crash at Munich this afternoon. Of the crew of six and 38 passengers on board, including a baby, these are the people so far known to have survived. Of the Manchester United party, Matt Busby, manager, and the following players. Greg, Wood, Folks, J. Blancheflower, Morgans, Berry, Charlton, Violet, and scan. The hospital staff worked their miracles on a damaged squad, but some would clearly never play again. Some hovered between life and death. Amongst them, Matt Busby. The news numbed the football world. Fans everywhere shared their grief. In Manchester, supporters gathered at the ground to hear and learn the latest bulletins coming from Munich. The final toll showed that of the 44 who boarded the plane, 23 had died, eight of them players, Busby's babes, Bobby's friends, a band of brothers. Sympathetic authorities postponed fixtures and relaxed transfer regulations, but United had to contain their grief and face the world again. I think we've got a pleasant nucleus for rebuilding but it'll take time. And so, furthermore, 
in rebuilding, of course, we've got to get the background to come on again, the youth to come on again. That might take a little bit, a, a lot of sorting out. When football returned to Old Trafford on February the 19th, 1958, spectators found a programme in which no name could be printed with any certainty. The match in the fifth round of the FA Cup was against Sheffield Wednesday. There's so much emotion in, involved in there. I actually felt sorry for Sheffield Wednesday. They have to play that particular game uh, because the crowd seemed to will the ball in, into the goals and, uh, and Manchester United beat them 3 0. I've been home for a couple of weeks and, and I, was, I was pretty pretty much recovered. But I came down and I was told I better not play in that particular match. But once I came down and I saw the game and I was ready then to, to get stuck into it and I, I played in it from then on. Behind locked gates at Old Trafford, 60,000 lucky fans watched Manchester United kick off against West Bromwich in striped shirts in the sixth round cup replay. On a rain-soaked pitch, United were battling on, still undefeated since the Munich disaster. But the big question was, could these untried United youngsters continue to stand the big match straight? Crash survivor Bobby Charlton sweeps through, up Colin Webster stabs the ball home. United have won. The last minute goal puts them in the semi-final. Manchester United kicked off, Fulham in white shirts. Manchester, with their gaze on Wembley, in spite of everything, were first on the warpath, and they opened the scoring with one from Charlton. Second Division Fulham, aiming to reach Wembley for the first time in their history, were quick to retaliate. Within a minute, Stevens equalised. There was little to choose between the two teams in the next 20 minutes. Then Fulham struck again, taking the lead through Hill. And the last goal of the match came just before the whistle blew. It was another by Charlton. So the battle had to be fought all over again. Manchester kicked off in their semi-final replay at Highbury against Fulham in white shirts. A misty day with plenty of goals. And Dawson got the first for United. The Londoners playing on a London ground quickly showed they had the answer. And in 20 minutes, Stevens equalised. Back came United on the hard road to Wembley when Dawson got his second through Macedo's hands. One down again, but not dismayed, Fulham attacked. A nice run by Langley gave Chamberlain the chance to level the score, two all. What a match this was, with one goal following another in rapid succession. Just before half-time, Manchester got their third through Brennan. Changing ends with a goal in hand once more, United now resolved to make that Wembley visit certain. They were 4-2 when Dawson got his hat-trick. You might have thought the Londoners had now had it, but they didn't think so, and they recovered lost ground when Dwight scored. Could they force another replay? Manchester United said no to that. In the last minutes, they settled the matter with a Charlton goal. So they meet Bolton at Wembley. But the wave of emotion could not carry United to victory against Nat Lofthouse and co. Four crash survivors were in the team, Charlton coming closest to scoring, but another incident against their goalkeeper sealed the defeat. But I think really people were more concerned that Manchester United had survived everything and, and they'd got things moving again and to, to get to the final itself was the achievement. And I don't really think that there was the, that there was the, the great need to win it. The mere fact that we got there meant that uh, things were going to tick over again and continue. By now, Bobby Charlton had won his first England cap. It was against Scotland at a packed Hamden Park. England won 4-0. Charlton and a lovely goal! I couldn't believe that I was actually playing for England with Tom Finney and, and, and Billy Wright. And uh, Tom Finney got the ball on the touchline and squared it back. And I'd always been taught to follow up anyone that went to the dead ball line. And, and I'd, I'd just caught the ball nicely on the volley as it came across. And, uh, and I scored my first international goal. 1958 was World Cup year. England's last Wembley appearance before it was a 2-1 win over Portugal. Bobby Charlton scored both goals. I scored a lot of important goals and of course, I, I suppose uh, there's a lot of sympathy with Man Manchester United and, and, and I was pushed probably into the England team. Uh, well, it's a lot, I, I would never, never have got in. Douglas. Douglas to Charlton. 
A great goal by Charlton. Oh, that's a typical Bobby Charlton goal. Nice pitch it. And Charlton. Managed to get away from Blanche on many an occasion has been. And Greg coming out there. Charlton knocks it in the net, in the net, yes! And up goes Douglas, and there's Douglas. And a lovely goal by Charlton! Despite those goals, although in the squad for Sweden, Bobby did not get a game in the finals. The press thought he should have, and afterwards, he showed why against Northern Ireland. Here's to Charlton. This is great man Charlton. And great goal. Oh, what a goal. Charles Tinney once again. In now to Haynes. Charlton calling for it. Comes to him. And a great goal by Charlton. That's a typical Bobby Charlton goal. Playing alongside Charlton in that England team was future England manager Bobby Robson. I then dropped back into midfield. Bobby got into the team as a winger, as a wide player. He ultimately, obviously, later on in his career, changed and went into the deep line centre forward, played with number nine on his back. But in his early career, he um, uh, consolidated his position at outside left. We played in those days with two wings, Brian Douglas, at outside right, Bobby Charlton at outside left, Jimmy Greaves and Bobby Smith at front, John Haynes and I played in midfield. And we were a very successful formation, very uh, good England team. Both Charlton and Robson were amongst the goals in an 8-0 trouncing of Mexico at Wembley. This is Bobby's first. Then the Haynes-Robson combo got another. Charlton's second was a characteristic left foot, just unstoppable. And then came his hat trick. By the time of the next World Cup finals in 1962 in Chile, Bobby was an automatic choice. His goal against Argentina took England to the quarter finals. And it's hit the post! Certainly, Roma was completely boxed with that one. He thought it was going to be a centre. Back come England. Charlton. Are we going to have a shot? He scored! And Bobby Charlton has scored the second after 41 minutes. England were eventually beaten by Brazil. At this time, Charlton was still an orthodox winger, as Jimmy Armfield recalled. I, I remember one game very distinctly. He was playing on the left wing in that famous run, run we had in the England side. About 61, 62, we scored this tremendous number of goals. And I remember us playing Brazil in the World Cup quarter final in Chile. And he absolutely ran the socks off uh, Jalma Santos. And we couldn't tuck these balls away. Had the position been reversed, if Bobby had been in the middle, I kept thinking to myself, we'd have got to the semi final. If we'd have got to the semi final, I think we'd have won it. But it, eventually, they drafted him into the middle because there was more in his game. And there was more chance, I think, that. Matt Busby saw there was more chance for him to get their shots on target. I think that's what did it, really. For the next season, United had been joined by a new forward. With Dennis Law, the results were electric. Mr Crawford of Doncaster checking his watches. And so Manchester United set the sixth round tie in action. Now Law, Law up to Giles and Manchester United coming onto the attack for the first time. And Giles showing a great turn of speed. And he does well to reach that one. It must be a goal by Law. Charlton. And here comes Sillett. Sillett to the outside right. Humphreys. And the goal. A quick saw. To Law now to Charlton. A lovely shot and a goal. That's a typical Bobby Charlton, Dennis Law move. And Charlton has equalised after 27 minutes. Charlton with the throw for United. Can they get back from Quicksaw? Maybe a shot from Charlton. And he scored a beautiful goal. Four minutes of the second half gone and United are 2-1 in the lead. Well, that's the sort of finishing that makes Bobby Charlton one of the most dangerous players in the world. Giles. Trying to get inside. There's Quicksaw. 
Owen is present for Quicksilver, who's got number three. Leicester City were the opponents as Bobby tried for the third time to win the cup at Wembley. Noel Campbell does the honours for United, the team rebuilt by Matt Busby. United kicked off with this attack. If their expensive star players really proved their worth, the cup would be there. Leicester were the first to really settle down and conquer those cup final nerves. In fact, for the first 15 minutes, the white shirts had by far the best of it. They narrowly missed taking an early lead. This is the kind of super soccer that brings the heart into the mud. United continued to play great football, but their fans had to wait until the 39th minute for a first goal by Dennis Law. One nil. That was the state of the parties as Leicester kicked off for the second half, determined to really get back into the game. But United, with Bobby Charlton putting in some good work, were in command. Third got their well-deserved second. for one of Leicester's few second-half sorties with Gibson, number 10, and outside right Riley threatening the goal. <laughs> Pressure like this produced Leicester's only goal, a beautiful diving header from Keyword. United remained undisputed masters and got their final goal through her. Three one. What a great performance from a team that's been under threat of relegation. United's captain Noel Cantwell leads his men up to the Royal Box. For them all, it's the fulfilment of an English footballer's ambition the cup and a cup medal. Incidentally, it's a moment of triumph for their manager, Matt Busby. Proof that he has most successfully rebuilt United. We shall never forget the Munich air tragedy. The following season, the third ingredient was added to create the trinity of Law, Charlton and a young Irishman, George Best. The combination changed the world. Best again. Brilliant football. Charlton. To Charlton. What a goal! They just don't come any better than that. O'Neill. Best. I enjoyed playing with him, so he's a very, very uh, brave player, great in the air, and, and knocking any half chances in, inside of it. But was electric, and the people loved watching him. George Best was actually, he actually came up through the juniors. Um, and I remember a couple, of the, a couple of the coaching staff saying, we've got a little diamond playing in the, in the A team, in the reserves, you know, and he's gonna be in the first team any time. They were all world-class players. We, uh, to get three world-class players in the same team was something special in uh, British football. And they were definitely world-class uh, in, in a class of their own in the 60s. There's more, and it's 3 nil. It was great to play in because you, you really never knew what was going to happen. We could go in and we could play absolutely lousy and nothing would work, but the crowds flocked in week after week after week because they were frightened to death that they might miss the, the game 
when everything just exploded, when, when George Best dribbled past men and Dennis Law scored brilliant goals and, and I hit one from outside the box, perhaps. And it was just a magic period. Yeah, well, it was a lovely feeling to be in a side uh, that had so much confidence in, in its own ability. I mean, we never ever went out thinking we were going to lose. And most of the time we didn't. Uh, I mean, the time, sometimes we were given teams a two, three goal start. And we were still in with a chance, and a lot of times we, we, we turned it around. Brilliant football. Charlton! Our team talks were very short, sometimes non existent. He basically said, enjoy yourselves. He'd maybe go through the other team and name one or two players, but that, I mean, it was all, our team talks lasted five minutes. He threw the ball to the captain, whoever it was on the day, and said, go out and enjoy yourselves. And that's the way we did it. Charlton. Charlton to best. Third and Law in the middle. Charlton lurking on the penalty area. There's Law, and it's 3-0. Beautiful goal by Law. Now in comes Hurd, onside this time. And Law's equalised! Best is onside. Charlton to Law, it's four. Free kick then to Manchester United. Oh, and this may be the first one. And it is the first one, and it's Law. In comes Creran. It's a good one, Law. He scored. It's a good job, Lars. Cut that one off, isn't it? Back pass by Mills, Canelli, Law is equalised. What a terrible goal! Thrown away and Mills is. Yes. With McCready and McCready made a catch and it's a magnificent goal. Yes. What a magnificent goal! A truly brilliant. Garden. Well, this weather that could be dangerous. Law's there. A loose player is Morgan. Law! That's it! The Watford defence giving Law the kind of room no player can be allowed, and especially Dennis Law. It's again Law. That's it! Oh, and old Trafford, the Celtics loaded. Meanwhile, Jackie and Bobby, the two Ashington schoolboys, bitter club rivals of course, were about to become teammates for England. We played at Nottingham against Leeds United in the semi-final of the FA Cup and they beat us in the last minute. Uh, Billy Bremner scored a header and I couldn't have been more down. I remember seeing our Jack after the match and, it, and he was euphoric because he'd, he'd been picked to play for England. He'd, he'd had notification that day that he was playing for England and uh, I didn't assume that I was going to be playing, but I thought, well, that's fantastic. I wish you'd have told me on a different day, though, because I felt really lousy. And we played against Scotland together at Wembley. He, he actually passed to me for the first goal, if, if I remember rightly. I don't think he meant it, but, but it actually flew to me. And I, and I turned around and I just hit it as hard as I could at the goal, and he just flew past this defender. I was aware that it's the first time the two brothers had ever been playing for England together this century. And uh, you know, it, it made me feel very proud of where we'd come from in Ashington, and and uh, and the history of the family was it was all there when we when we played. More history was on its way though. 1966, cometh the hour, cometh Bobby Charlton. As well as Wembley, the contest embraces all the great soccer centres around the country: Middlesbrough, Manchester, Sheffield, Sunderland, Liverpool, and Birmingham. The first World Cup ever held in this country, it's the greatest sporting event Britain has ever seen. And never had England stood a better chance of winning. I am very pleased that this country is acting as host for the final phases of the World Cup. I welcome all our visitors and feel sure that we shall be seeing some fine football. 
After a short speech, Her Majesty meets England's first opponents, Uruguay, twice winners of the World Cup, captained by Troche. Bobby Moore's men with only one change in the team that recently beat Poland. So England, who've never yet won the World Cup, begin the last leg of their quest for the trophy. And they begin with Moore, Wilson and Bobby Charlton sending the Uruguayans back into defence. Then Connelly forces a corner. Altogether England got 15 corners, Uruguay only one. But a corner is no guarantee of a goal. Uruguay sometimes took the initiative and it was lucky for goalie Banks facing right into the sun that most of the time the play was in the other half. In fact, defence is the Uruguayans' great strength. Seldom could England pierce their uncompromising determination. Not even Jimmy Greaves. Alf Ramsey spent over three years planning his World Cup machine. What a disappointment to see this machine so easily obstructed. It was the same in the second half, with England becoming almost frantic for a win. But Uruguay were more than content with a stalemate and the one point they received for a drawn game. Surely this one should have got through. So that was it, and some of the England team only too glad to get off the field. Of course, disappointment is not defeat, but one axiom has been learned. Never underestimate your opponent. And England meet Mexico. Both teams had drawn their previous games, and this was England's chance to prove they could pierce the Latin American defence. Mexico kick off, and the ball goes straight to Banks. He only had to make two saves in the whole match. Now England sweep into attack, setting the picture for the rest of the game. Mexico put eight men into the defence zone and for nearly the whole of the match kept them there. But when they did come out, they too, in spite of some clever passing, failed in front of the goal. Watch Bobby Charlton, racing through the Mexicans with the ball at his feet, he shoots. The second half was a repetition of the first. Time and again, England's forwards pierced the solid defence, but just as often they lacked the accuracy to score. Mexican goalie Calderon played a brilliant game, adding to England's discomfort. Now the second goal, Reeve shoots. It's cleared and Hunt nets it from the rebound. And I remember the Mexicans were playing very tight. They had nine or ten back and it was about 60 minutes into the second half. And Bobby picked a ball up and I was right behind him. And he picked it up in her half, carried it, dropped his shoulder, went one way, dropped his shoulder another way. And it's the best goal I've ever seen. I was stood right behind it and as soon as it left his foot, it was in the net. I did realise it was, it was a really good goal. Uh, but more than that was we were off and racing and, and then from then on, you know, we, we easily beat the, uh, the Mexicans. I think we got another goal. Uh, qualified by beating France after that and uh, Argentina in a really difficult quarter-final um, uh, when Ratin was, was ab abusing the referee and, and not accepting decisions and eventually I actually lost the game for his side, I, I thought. Ratan is sent off. That is the second Argentinian sent off in the competition. And Ratan, the captain, is sent off. England beat Argentina 1-0 with a Jeff Hurst header. 
And of course, by the time we got to the semi-final, I really did feel as though, you know, it's for us there to win. Now Bobby Charlton using that as a cipher. Great screen from someone now, and it's totally Hunt. Charlton has scored. Bobby Charlton gets his 39th goal for England. This is more. Now to Cohen. England making Portugal chase. Charlton handled it. Charlton handled it, so it's a penalty. Jackie Charlton had to handle that one. Bobby Charlton gets two goals. Jackie Charlton now handles the ball in the penalty area. And it's seven goal Eusebio going to take it. 2-1. And 2-1 it stayed. Now for the final and the Germans first match against Switzerland that the Germans played, there, there was this young midfield player called Beckenbauer who, who was so strong running and positive and wanted to go forward and little one-twos and not, I think he scored two goals against the Swiss if I'm not mistaken. But he was a revelation because we'd never seen anybody like that before and I think he was only 17 or 18. I, I'd played quite well in the semi-final so uh, Helmut Schoen, the German manager, had designated that Franz Beckenbauer should stay with me. And, and I had been told by Alf Ramsey that whatever happens, I could express myself still, but whenever we didn't have the ball, I had to look for Beckenbauer. And literally, literally, uh, we cancelled each other out for the whole of the match, which didn't bother me one iota. I, I was only bothered about winning, and I wanted to win. And if, if me staying with Franz Beckenbauer all day was the way we were going to win, well, fair enough, I would do it. Held number 10. Who oh, was the better? To Haller, a goal! West Germany has scored! Oh, with a free kick. In goes! It's an equaliser! Ball with the corner. Hurst. coming in. And he's... Oh, yes, it must do! They have done! Weber has scored in the last seconds! Ball. Jack Charlton. Peters. Bobby Charlton. Oh! Hit the post. His ball running himself daft. says no it's a goal it's a goal all the Germans go mad at the referee and here comes Hurst he's got some people are on the pitch they think it's all over it is now it's four so history was made and Bobby Charlton forever immortalised alongside the other heroes who wore those famous red shirts. Sir Alf held the Jules Rime trophy aloft, and Charlton was our player of the tournament. Now there remained one last great challenge. After three losing semi-finals, United were due European glory. Manchester United versus Real Madrid. Two of the most successful and highly respected teams in the football world today meeting in the first leg of the European Cup semi-final. Good one. And Law caught them. It's Aston. A best. 
Craddock. Oh, you hit the post. Styles. Best to get. Good flick, that was my best. This is Aston. Again, the cue at the far post for the cross if he can get it back. Ran well for him. Best. One nil doesn't seem much, but it, it, it to us we're a bit more experienced now, and we thought, well, they they've got to at least score once, and they've got to stop us from scoring and away from home. And at, at half time, I couldn't believe it. In the, in the second leg, we were three we were three nil down. I was waiting for Samad to say something to lift us, and I, as, as captain, was was wondering whether I should say something to lift us. And there didn't seem anything to say. There didn't seem anything we could do about it. And we came out and we just battled. And suddenly they lost it. For some reason or other, they lost it. And, and we, we got a goal. David Sadler scored a goal. And, and suddenly it was 3-2. It was and, uh, and they'd already scored an own goal. And then it was 3-2. And I, rem I remember with, with uh, five or six minutes to go, I think it was, seemed like that to me anyway, George Best went down the right-hand side of the field, pulled the ball back, and, and uh, of all people, I could not believe Bill Folds. Bill Folks, a centre half who, who'd never gone up upfield for anything other than a corner kick. He just slotted it into the back of the net. And, and suddenly it was 3-3 three, three on the day, 4-3 on aggregate, and we'd won. Then I thought, well, we've won the European Cup, because whatever happens, there's no way that we'll lose the final. I don't care who we're playing. The European Cup, uh, which everybody wanted to win, uh, because they, they didn't feel that Sir Mad Busby would have, would have had a proper career without having been the manager of, of the European Championship side. And, um, with everything that happened at Munich, it was important that we did eventually one day win the European Cup. And that was when we won the European Cup, the, the Real Madrid semi-final. And eventually got uh, to play Benfica in the final. United have got Benfica on the run now. Sadler, Charlton, a goal! Torres, now to Grasa, Se Agosto. Torres, and a chance. It's equalized by Grasa. Simoesh, Ben Baker on marks in the middle. This is Ben. This is you, Sandio. Oh, what a save by Sidney. And what a sportsman, you, Sandio, when he could have won that match. To applaud Stephanie like that. Now best. Oh, he's got a big chance. Oh, he goes. He has. Charlton. Charlton to Aston. Oh, and he's got the legs of Adolfo. Last corner. At the function after the match, I, um, there was a big function and all the people who had been with Man United through thick and thin were invited to this function and, and I believe that Sir Mad got up and, and sang What a Wonderful World and thought, yeah, everything's all right with the world just at the moment. Unfortunately, I, I'd, I was so drained during the day with everything that had happened, uh, the humidity and, and the, I think just the nerves of, of what was happening at the match, that I, I, I just was sick. I couldn't go to the function, unfortunately. In 1969, another milestone in Bobby Charlton's career. Captain, for the first time, on this is 90th International, Bobby Charlton, nearest the camera, leading England. And incidentally, another record for Bobby Charlton, he's played against 32 different countries, a record held by no other footballer in the entire world. Bobby Charlton to take the corner. It's there. Jack Charlton.
That year, it was Bobby Charlton, OBE. And the following April... Hidden from this vast crowd at Wembley Stadium, Bobby Charlton, England's captain for the night, playing in his 100th international for his country, waits to make his sentimental journey across the Wembley Stadium. A stadium he's graced so often with distinction for his club, Manchester United, in the FA Cup and the European Cup final, that he's played so well in international matches so often for England. And just listen to the crowd as Charlton leads out England. I always had a great regard for Billy Wright. And Billy Wright, who, who played 100 games, I, I always remember, how can anybody do that, you know, play 100 matches? And I thought about it often. And um, I never thought that I would ever aspire to that. But nevertheless, here we were playing against uh, Ireland. And um, terrific company. I, I was very pleased because something about 100, it's like a cricketer getting a century, you know. It, it, it's a nice round field and it takes some achieving, really. And I thought to myself, well, there's not a lot of players really around the world that's done that. So I, I feel, really felt quite pleased with myself. We won, I think, quite easily. And I, I scored one at the end, which everybody seemed to enjoy, which is really one that Pat Jennings just got his fingertips to and I was able to knock it into an internet. This was one of the easier goals I scored. Hughes. It was to be Bobby Charlton's farewell to Wembley as a player. England were to leave for what many believe to be the greatest World Cup in history. The star player for England was Bobby. Bobby, Bobby has been a credit to the game, uh, a credit to himself, a credit to the game, and uh, will always be uh, remembered as such. And I, I would have thought that this particular player uh, has more effect throughout the world than any other player uh, throughout the world. In Lyon, England met with the most heart-rending of defeats. And for Bobby, it was his final game in an England shirt. It was 1966 all over again, right down to the colours. For this quarter-final, England were in red, West Germany in white. Uwe Zähler was still there. So too was Franz Beckenbach. Although the shade temperature was in the high 90s, Bobby Charlton didn't spare his legs. If things went well for England, it was planned that he would be substituted. Before long, the plan was working to perfection. Alan Mullery started a move with a long swinging pass to Keith Newton. And when Newton played the ball into the area, it was Mullery who'd made the well-timed run to score. In the second half, another of the class of 66 put England two up. Martin Peters the score. With 22 minutes remaining, it seemed safe to rest Bobby Charlton. But Beckenbauer scored for Germany, even as Bobby prepared to leave the pitch. England's grip was broken. A header by Uwe Zähler was to take the game into extra time. A third German goal, scored in most spectacular style by Gerd Müller, settled the match. For many, the substitution of Bobby was the subject of massive controversy. Not for Jack, though. It's all right in retrospect, looking back and saying, if you hadn't brought Bobby off, England probably would have won the game. It didn't happen. But I, I agreed with Alf. I think our kid needed a rest. He had three very difficult and hard games in a short period of time. Now we know we shouldn't have. At that particular time, Gordon Banks was unquestionably the greatest goalkeeper in the world by miles. Oh. He, he was almost unbeatable. I mean, we used to practice, when we were practice shooting in Mexico where the ball flies very fast. I mean, he used to stagger us. You know, he, he, even hardened players, you know, that had seen it all, and they were saying, dear me, that, that's almost, he, he was making impossible saves. Impossible saves. So I think the mere fact that he went down with a tummy upset the day of the only sudden death match that we had, really, I think was, uh, was a big contribution. 
people say that uh, that Alf Ramsey substituting me was was the crucial factor, but I would I would rather say it was it was Gordon Banks because they could have done without me, but but he he at that particular time was so good I thought it was a replacement. After three more seasons with Manchester United, Bobby Charlton decided to retire from club as well as international football. There would be no more trophies, just the worldwide respect and affection he had earned. His last game at Old Trafford was preceded by a presentation. Sir Matt Busby was at his side. For over 20 years, the United faithful had worshipped him and he had scored 249 goals. Just one more special one was on the list, but it was not to be. Afterwards, he shared his modest thoughts yet again. Presentations from other players that are in the same line of business as yourself. It's, it's a tremendous honor for me, you know, that Sheffield United, Manchester City, Stoke City have given me uh, a gift, and Manchester United in my own club. I mean, it's tremendous. I have, uh, I'm very fortunate. There's lots of players done a lot. Maybe I've won a, bit, uh, a few more honors than most, but uh, I'm a very lucky lad. Five days later, as Jack left the field at the Dell for the last time, Bobby was playing his final game for Manchester United at Stamford Bridge against Chelsea. The end of his 606th and final game, and he can look back like Jimmy Greaves did and say he played everyone in the first division, in the toughest league in the world. Well, you had a uh, natural feeling for the, the game itself, and uh, then again, he had the ability to do things. He had the ability and he had a very good shot. He always had a very good shot. A thoroughbred oozed class and just to look at him on the field, he was like a, a ballet dancer in many ways and uh, graceful with power. There was life after the game, of course, for Bobby. A stint as a manager at Preston. Media work for the broadcasters. Family life, of course. And a lot of time and care spent passing on his knowledge to the young and the stream of kids who followed him to Old Trafford. And it has been at United that he spent most time and energy on the board and as an ambassador for the club. But then there could never be a better ambassador, not just for United, but for football itself than Sir Bobby. The most successful English player of them all and the most respected sportsman these four shores have ever produced. Bobby Charlton is a true legend and we are privileged to have met.